Hi, welcome to Uncork Your Mind. This is Debbie Giaquindo. I'm the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. And in this episode is Wine for Bet Street. And we discuss the Delaware grape with Abby Wilkums, who is the assistant winemaker at Lakewood Vineyards in Watkins Glen, New York. It's part of uh, Finger Lakes Wine Country. And I'm really excited to have Abby with us for this edition of Wine for Bet Street because I've known Abby since she was about 16 years old when I was helping with the New York Classic uh, wine competition in the Finger Lakes. Um, her grandma, Bev, was one of the people I was working with and Abby was helping as well. So it's really nice to see somebody just grow into the whole assistant winemaker position of her family uh, vineyard. And we got to taste her namesake wine, the Abby Rose. And right now I will turn you over to the podcast and you can learn all about Lakewood Vineyards and the Delaware Grape. Welcome to Uncork Your Mind, where we take the intimidation out of wine with your host, Debbie Giaquindo, the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. Whoa. Hey, everybody. <laughs> All right. Hope everybody is having a great day today. We are back at Wine for Bet Street, and we are up to the letter D, and we are talking Delaware today. No, 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 not the state, but the grape. And I'm excited because, honestly, when Debbie uh, said, oh, we, let's do Delaware, I'm like, all right, whatever. I didn't even know it was a great variety. So I am excited to learn about Delaware today. And with Debbie and I today, we have Abby Stamp from Lakewood Vineyards and Winery in the Finger Lakes. So we're going to get to that. And so before we get to introducing Abby and all the fun stuff about Delaware, just to let you know, I am your co-host, Lori. I'm a WSET level two graduate, UC Davis winemaking graduate. I am in the process of studying for the Spanish Wine Scholar Guild and Champagne Specialist and Cote de Ron. And as we were talking off camera, we just love to torture ourselves. So that's why I just <laughs> continuing to do that. So Deb, how about you? I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm known as the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a certified specialist of wine a uh, wine location specialist in port and champagne and a certified cherry wine specialist. I'm author of the book, Tapping the Hudson Valley, Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries, Traveling to the Hudson Valley uh, Wine Region. And I'm co-owner of, or partner in Trio North Wildwood. It's a restaurant in North Wildwood, New Jersey. So if you're visiting, we're open, come visit. And I'm also chairperson for the Hudson Valley uh, Wine and Spirits Competition. And I think that's all that's on my plate right now. See, torture <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> and Abby, can you give us a little brief introduction of yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Abby Stamp Wilkins, and I'm part of the Stamp family that owns Lakewood Vineyards Winery in the Finger Lakes. I'm the assistant winemaker there and a Cornell University graduate in viticulture and enology. And I've been full-time in the industry since 2013. So I'm really excited to be here tonight. Thanks. Awesome. Cornell. Thank you for joining us. Smart. Very smart. <laughs> we start with A, B, C, and we go all the way to C. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, now I know my ABCs, next time won't you sing with me? Each ladder makes a sound, let's sound them out now. We start with ABC and we go all the way to C. <laughs> so tonight we are drinking Lakewood Vineyards, Abbey Rose, Delaware. And the label is incredible. It kind of yes. reminds me of Guns N' Roses. Um... <laughs> But so I'm going to pour a glass. Let's pour a glass. Do our do our little slancha. Cheers. Ooh, pretty color. 
I know. And let's start learning about <laughs> Delaware. So Slancha. Slancha. All right. Ooh. We're set. Okay, okay, we are set. We are all set. So Abby, I, I just want to thank you for joining us tonight. And I'm really happy when I contacted Lakewood because become a winemaker and join the family business because working for family is not easy. <laughs> um, so I've worked for other people and comparatively, I think working for family is easy, but uh, <laughs> it's not something I always knew I wanted to do. Actually, uh, I changed my mind like 30 times growing up as to what I wanted to do for a career. And it wasn't until my freshman year of college, actually, that I decided to pursue a winemaking degree. So I started off pre-med and, you know, quickly changed my mind and decided to start <laughs> with culture and analogy. But I think that somewhere along the line, I must have known subconsciously because conveniently I was already going to Cornell and there aren't many schools that have a winemaking program. Right. So I was able to just transfer internally and start on that track. But I do have a couple of siblings as well. And my brother, Ben, is also involved yeah. in wine business. Yes. And uh, yeah, too. Like, I think he came out of the womb screaming that he wanted to be a winemaker. Like he was opposite <laughs> of me, always knew. And uh, yeah, but I think it's the fact that we weren't, I mean, we were always put to work, but we weren't told we had to stay there. You know, we could study whatever we wanted. And as long as we were working, you know, it didn't have to be in the wine industry at all. So it was the fact that it was really my choice. And uh, in the end, I was like, what better business is there to be in than winemaking? Did you have a, well, you had said you were pre-med, but um, while you were changing your mind into the viticulture aspect of it, do you, do you prefer the the vineyards or do you prefer the the winery because like i mean i know it's a flow from a to b right it is a flow yeah. but sometimes people prefer being the outside part of it and then letting the winery do its thing and other people like doing in the winery so i am pretty much exclusively in the winery um okay. and the my degree was viticulture and enology but you concentrate in one and mine was in enology. So kind of on the path that I'm on right now. And uh, I used to be in the vineyard a little bit more, but we've just gotten to the point that I don't have time, <laughs> you know? So uh, my uncle's actually the vineyard manager and he does a really good job with that. And I, I only make it out there rarely more during harvest for sure. But uh, the rest of the year, I don't spend a lot of time in a vineyard. So you work side by side with your dad. Yes, my dad and my brother actually, and they're kind of like clones of the same person. So it's really <laughs> hilarious. We purchased another hundred acres or so there, which some has been turned to vine, but it's a lot of wooded area and fields too. So there's that. And then um, south, not even a quarter of a mile, we have another vineyard that is 100% Riesling. And then another mile, mile and a half north, we have a vineyard that is just Niagara and Frontenac grapes on the opposite side of the road. So it's all within two miles, but um, it's not all adjoining. And which which lake are you on? Oh, sorry. We're on Seneca which, Lake. So yeah. Which, which finger are you on? Yes, <laughs> on, on the, the west. middle finger of the Finger Lake. <laughs> and uh, it is also the deepest one. So uh, originally- You're on the west like, side of the lake. Yes. We're on the west side, just north of Watkins Glen, which is a small town at the southern tip of Seneca Lake. So we are on the west side and we're the first winery on the main state route there. On the Washington. right. <laughs> yeah, on the right, yeah, if you're driving north, yep. <laughs> so now your grandparents actually started Lakewood. So can you give us a little bit more history of the winery itself? Like how did they start yeah. it, why? Okay, so it actually goes back further to my great grandparents, um, Frank and Lucy Stamp actually moved to the Finger Lakes and bought Lakewood Farm in 1951. So um, kind of like their retirement job. My grandfather had been a dentist in the military and I, uh, I think they had been living in Maryland uh, previously, but they had family here, bought a rundown peach and apple orchard. And then the following spring started planting grapes and it kind of went from there. Of course, my grandfather was immediately dragged in as well as his uh, new wife, uh, my grandmother. And they were put to work and it ended up 
kind of being my grandfather's baby, uh, the vineyard. And they were grape growers for many years until 1988 was the first vintage that the family started making wine. So at that point, um, there wasn't as big of a market for grapes. It was a lot of juice grapes, some hybrids, uh, and it, everybody's having trouble selling their grapes. And it was kind of like a last ditch effort for my family to not go bankrupt. Uh, my parents were living in Ohio at the time. My father was the um, extension enologist for Ohio State Ag oh. Research Station. And, uh, but he had a food science degree and winemaking experience. So they all, Basically, my parents, grandparents, a family friend who is the only like non-family owner. He's also my godfather, so he's building. Um, it was the first vintage was forty-five hundred gallons of wine, so pretty small. And at that point, we had about forty-five acres of grapes planted, so we were still selling a lot of the grapes from the farm. But uh, basically, the thought was, they, my grandfather said, if this doesn't work out. Um, this could be turned into a house. <laughs> so yeah. And you all can live here. Yeah. <laughs> so that was seven different wines they made that first year. And now we make, I don't know the exact number, probably 18 or so for our label. And uh, we've planted more varieties since. And now we make 120,000 gallons of wine. And oh. uh, it's grown, yeah, slightly over the years, but it's been steady and Nothing huge all at once. Wow. And now you're going strong. You have an awesome tasting room. You're buying yeah. more vineyards. <laughs> yeah. I just tell my parents, I wish they had more children because <laughs> it's busy. <laughs> and, and, and Abby, how many different varietals do you, do you have planted? So we have, um, I think, 15 different varieties in the ground, and that's on about 95 acres now and that's everything from labrusca to french american hybrids to vinifera really um, all over the place well and now so we're here to talk about delaware right so yeah. can you tell us a little bit about uh first of all how have you always been growing delaware always um as long as i can remember but okay. uh it was yeah back in the 50s actually 1959 was when our older Delaware vineyard was planted. So not long after the vineyard started, or the farm started in general, uh, I was put in the ground. And then another planting was put in in 1995, I believe. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. And so now, can you give us a little bit background on the grape itself? Like its history, is it considered a hybrid or is it, you know, is it American native? What, what exactly is it? And so, do we know who created it? <laughs> uh, kind of. <laughs> um, so, yes, it is generally considered a Labrusca, but really it is a hybrid. Um, and it is first known in New Jersey, actually, in Frenchtown, New Jersey. Okay. And there's a gentleman there who was, uh, like, crossing grapevines. And Abraham Thompson got some of the cuttings and was really excited about them and sent them in to the Massachusetts Horticultural Society and uh, labeled, because they were in Delaware, Ohio, it <laughs> was labeled Grapes from Delaware City, Ohio, and that is, they just became called Delaware from there. And um, they were kind of favorable for wine because while they grow well in the harsher Northeast climate, uh, they aren't quite as foxy as a lot of your Labruscas might be. All right, so it's a Labrusca. Okay, awesome. Oh, you know, as I'm tasting it, kind of, you can... Yeah, sort, you can taste it. You can kind of see how it's related related to it. But yeah, definitely not like that that Labrusca that... Right, know, it's a little... Full in your face. They've yeah. done... Um, they've looked into like the genetics and it was determined that it is a cross between Vinifera and uh, Vitis Labrusca and um, Estivalis. So it's... They're thinking closer to like half vinifera, which can explain why it in some ways behaves more like a vinifera. And then it obviously has yeah. some some of those Labrusca characters. Yes. Right. And that that co that interested me too. It's like, all right, we're gonna it's a cross between three. So it's mom, dad, and 
cousin and had her, it, you know. it was a threesome <laughs> and like whoever <laughs> whoever showed up over the yeah. months, right <laughs> pretty much <laughs> i haven't been able to find the specific varieties that were the parents to the delaware grape so that remains unknown yeah I, the mystery of wine Yep. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, lots of mysteries out there. Yeah, these yeah. crazy immigrants just breeding grapes in their backyard and uh, came up with something special, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Abby, uh, you produce um, the Delaware grape is in the Abbey Rose as a blend. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is so it always a blending wine? Or a blending grape? No, it is often, maybe even more often used as a varietal. And there really aren't like a ton of them in the Finger Lakes anymore. I know a few wineries that do a varietal Delaware, but it is grown throughout the Northeast and in the Midwest as well. And while it can be like a blush often, I mean, the grape is considered a red grape, but it's really a dark pink color okay. with it, as well as dessert wines. So uh, many different styles with Delaware alone, or at least, you know, 90% of the blend. Whereas we do it in this wine, it's only 15%. And it adds really something special, I think, because you do have those other Labrusca grapes in there as well that tend to dominate. This gives it a little something more delicate, I believe. So. What else is in the Abbey Rose? So it has Concord and Ives as well. And Ives? Ives, yeah. That's a new one. I've never heard of Ives. Okay. With a oh, so Y or I? Um, with an I. With an I-V-E-S? I-V-E-S, yes. Oh. And uh, not a lot of people grow that one anymore, <laughs> but... Uh, and then it's got a little bit of Vincent, which is a French American hybrid that makes it that red color because those grapes produce more of a pink wine to begin with, but it loses a lot of color through fermentation. So we want it to be a sweet red. I was looking at the pictures of the Delaware grape on the bunches. The color is similar to me. I thought the color was similar to like the red Thompson seedless grape. Yeah, a little bit, and that it's not really highly pigmented, but it's right, right. Red. There's like a little bit of little bit of the grease, you know, the the gray yeah. color. I have. Hold know, on, let me screen share. There. Oh shoot, I don't know what's up on my screen share, but let me bring the the grape up um, on my screen. Let's see. There is a screen share. No, here we go. Here we go. That's the um, grape. Right, yeah. So yeah right. It's kind of like the Thompson red. Yeah. But, yep. <laughs> Little smaller berries, but smaller berries. Okay. So that was what I was going to ask you is like tell us about the grape itself in the vineyard. Um, you know, so you know, a lot of winemakers say, Oh, it's a great, you know, it, about any grape. It's great in the vineyard, difficult in the winery. Other people say, oh, it's difficult in the vineyard, great in the winery. You know, how, how does Delaware act in the vineyard and then how does it correlate into the wine? Um, I'd say it's pretty favorable in both really. Um, from a winemaking perspective, it's usually a very easy, clean fermenter. It smells lovely during harvest or during fermentation really. It's Here's really harvest. Delicious. And uh, then it also, oh yeah, there's harvest. Yeah, wow. there's harvest. <laughs> yeah. So clean fermenter, um, we don't have any problems getting it through fermentation. It's, I mean, it presses off really quite well. Overall, it's not super finicky in the cellar. So I like it. And whenever we go to work with it post-fermentation, it's just, it smells so pretty. So <laughs> um, I have no complaints from a winemaking perspective, but in the vineyard, it's uh, it's not perfect, but it's it's pretty good. Um, it is a little bit susceptible to downy mildew, but when I asked uh, Dave, our vineyard manager, how he would rate it from like zero being really difficult, ten being incredibly easy, he said it's a seven. So uh, compared to you know the Pinot and stuff we have right down the 
vineyard from it. It's uh, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> Uh, well, that that that's a statement right there. If compared to the Pinot, it's a piece of cake. I'm not the so. one doing it, but. You know. <laughs> uh, and we have um, two, like I mentioned, two different vineyards. We have the one from 1959 and the one from 1995. And one of the, I mean, so one of the vinifera-like characteristics of Delaware is that it is susceptible to phylloxera. And our older vineyard is actually own rooted. Oh. And the younger vineyard is grafted on 3309. And uh, seems like with the vigor we have on that site, the own rooted stuff does just fine, um, surprisingly. So, I mean, it's been there for over 60 years and no real issues. Um, and then the grafted site is actually incredibly vigorous and the canopy gets like a little little crazy <laughs> especially on a wet year uh and that's i mean that's some of the labrusca parentage there but uh there's a lot of vigor with that one so it has its challenges i suppose but overall do you drop a lot of clusters of during during the course of of growing no, that's not usually one that we need to drop fruit on. Uh, it's something that basically you control your yield as much as you can with pruning and uh, then you just let it all ripen. And most years we have no problems with that. What's neat about Delaware um, from a grape growing and winemaking standpoint is that component for some of these blends as well. And it's just uh, offset a little bit from when you're harvesting those so they don't all you know, uh, fall on top of each other and make it too crazy. <laughs> Are they early harvesting or late harvesting? When does you usually harvest them? Um, kind of in the middle, maybe towards the earlier side. So mm -hmm. in 2021, it was end of September, the 30th that we picked Delaware. 2020 was like a couple weeks earlier, the 10th or 11th. And then 19 was actually into October. So, I mean, that shall, tells you a little oh, something about our climate in the Finger Lakes the last few years, but also, uh, yeah, it's kind of on the earlier end, but not one of your first ones. Like typically we pick Niagara first and then the and Silver. Bond, when later. do you pick that Niagara? When, when does your harvest typically start? Um, I tell people like first or second week of September typically, but okay. So you're because I was like, wow, you're considering that early. I'm like, October for us is late. You know, well, like, yeah, yeah. So 19, it was kind of like a later, later harvest. Um, so that was late for Delaware grapes, but I think it was like October 25th or 20th that we were picking Riesling. So, uh, and we have when we do Riesling, it's a lot of tonnage. So that's kind of like. That's the later <laughs> harvest stuff in my mind. You have to make sure you have the room for it too. Yeah, we got to save room. It's always fun juggling. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's talk about the Abbey Rose itself. So first, before we even get to the wine, just tell us about the label. Okay, so, I mean, we've, in our 33 years of uh, business, we've overhauled our labels a couple of times, but... This one was the most major one. Uh, and we did a similar one with like our Niagara and Catawba as well. So our sweeter native and hybrid wines. Uh, we had a local art artist design these actually. And we wanted it to be kind of nostalgic, but also fun and lighthearted. So you will notice across the board, all of our labels, our vinifera as well, incorporate the Rose logo. So, and that's actually what the second part of the wine name comes from, from our logo. And, and the no, they do not have wines named after them. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. But now uh, I know you have Ben, but who's your other sibling? My sister Amelia, she's a few years younger than me, and she actually lives in Vermont. Um, okay, not, not currently involved in the wine business, but I think it's inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> Just you when you think you're the out, table. they grab you and pull you back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, you had said that this has different uh, varieties in it, um, and you had said Vincent gives it the color. So, mm -hmm. Okay, another yeah. great variety. Yeah, I primarily I for color. 
That's one of your French American like red ones. It's this really inky, um, almost black looking grape. It's uh, not just the skin is colored, but the flesh is also red. Oh, so, oh okay. uh, it's a really cool one. It's a mess to work with, but it actually smells really nice. And it is great to use in products like this, where you want to just boost that color a little bit. You can do like 3% and you don't really taste it. Well, you really don't taste it at all. And uh, you can see it though. So that's where the Vincent comes in. Concord, I mean, you can definitely get that classic yeah. grape mm -hmm. nose to it. Ives to me typically comes across as like fresh strawberries. Yeah, I got the strawberry. That's what I wrote down. And then once you I have like a there, candied cherry also. Candied cherry also. Yes, I could see that. I all I always like contribute the candy to the Delaware grape. For me, okay. it's very candy like. Um it's also very perfumey. It can have some floral notes to it. It's um uh, it's intense, but, and it's amazing that at the percentage in this is like less than half of what it is of Concord Ives, but it still shows through and it gives that, that really sweetness, you know, mm -hmm. without as much of the fruit. I often say that this oh, kind of smells mm -hmm. like cotton candy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. And I don't want to cheapen it, but it's just that really like sweet confectionery nose to it well now you know they have the the thompson grapes that are yes the cotton, candy, are grapes. cotton candy grapes <laughs> yeah uh, and yeah then, i i have the i get the i get candy cherry i can get strawberry the there's there i'm getting i really don't like honeysuckle scented things <laughs> and uh it took me a couple of years and now i i adore the aromatics in this line but it definitely was adjusting to that because it was something that I didn't have good associations with prior to that. But alone, it almost, we actually used to make a varietal Delaware. Uh, we called it long stem pink, you know, adhering to the rose theme, but we ended up eliminating that product eventually because my theory is that it was too floral for a lot of consumers. It's oh. kind of like, Delaware is a tough sell, or sorry, <laughs> the Verstraminer can be a tough sell to your average consumer because it is very intense and very perfumey and you have to want that. And not everybody does. I think it's very polarizing. And I kind of think uh, Delaware was like your native counterpart to that. So it wasn't one of our best sellers, um, though we do still do a dessert line out of Delaware grapes. Uh, mm -hmm. We are not featuring it now because we are completely sold out. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that that is a fun one too. We pick them late harvest and freeze them and press them. Okay. And you get some of those floral notes still, but it also goes more along the lines of like honey, apricot, maybe a little bit of pineapple in there. Oh, wow. So it makes a really nice dessert wine. And I think some other wineries are doing that as well. With the Delaware grape? Yes, with the Delaware grape. So up in the Finger Lakes, who else produces wine from the Delaware grape? So I think the Fulkerson Winery has a Delaware. I'm not sure if they call it that. Um, and then Wagner produces a Delaware. And Chipika Wines, uh, which N. Kendall is half of, they do a Delaware Pet Nat. Okay. Oh, wow. And, um, actually, so this was weird that it was today, but we were tasting through dosage trials. Um, Aaron, who is, well, my aunt and also our vineyard manager's wife, she is our brand manager, but she's got a little side project we're working with her on uh, called Little Grasshopper Wines and their <laughs> Method Sparkling Wines. And she hasn't released the first vintage yet, but there's a Riesling, a Cuga, and a Delaware. So today we're tasting through dosage trials for the Delaware I think it was 2019 vintage okay. and it was amazing. It was incredible to see that wine that had been on Tarage for a couple of years. Uh, you still get some Delaware aromatics, but you get the yeastiness and the toastiness too. And it was incredibly complex and it, it is known as a great sparkling wine grape, but not a lot of people do that 
around here anymore. So it's kind of uh, yeah. Uh, rose. Mm -hmm. So yeah. a lot of people yeah. love that IRF sweetness scale on Riesling. So we put it on all of our wines. If you're in the liquor store or the wine shop and you don't know what to get, this will give you an inclination of whether or not it will be to your style, to your liking. Um, it is sweet. It's like four and a half percent residual sugar, I believe, with this vintage. And the alcohol is under 10%. So that's not typical for this wine. It's usually 10 and a half, not very high. But those... Those Concord Ives, they don't get incredibly high bricks, so you have less sugar to work with from the beginning. And 2021, which is the vintage we are all tasting right now, was a bit of a challenging vintage in the Finger Lakes. Um, really, really high yields and not a ton of sunshine and a lot and a lot of water, a lot of rain. So oh. bricks across the board were lower. And uh, we kind of just roll with it at Lakewood. Um, our Rieslings are going to be lower alcohol this year. You know, they're 10 to 11 and a half at the most. But, um, you know, that's vintage variation. You got to take what Mother Nature gives you and make the best of it. And Sorry. I like it for this wine because it is a super easy to drink wine. And when you have it, you know, under 11% like that, you can have a couple of glasses and not you know, not feel like crap the next day on a Wednesday when you have to go to work. So, right. right. <laughs> and I have to say, I think that it's a little, the, the scale is a little misleading because it, it's not as sweet on the palate as I was expecting it to be. Yes. But, you know, by the, by both the rose and the, and the alcohol, you know, I tell people all the time, okay, if, you know, if you're in the store and you're looking for a sweetness level, but you don't know, you know, mostly for Riesling, right? The yeah. higher the alcohol, the drier it's going to be. That's kind of like the general rule, you know? So at nine, nine, and then you had the rose pretty high up there. Yeah. I thought it was going to be sweet. So that, that lays claim to, to the acid that's in there. And I, you know, I'm guessing some of the, the Vincent is bringing some structure, some backbone to it. Yeah, See, I also think also it depends on how you perceive sweetness, because mm -hmm. to me, it I can tell. People smell some of these aromatics, and there's such sweet fruit notes. People that don't drink a lot of sweet wine are, like, scared that it's going to be cloying or heavy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think our goal with this is to keep it light, keep that acidity. And our picking decisions are based as much on acid as they are on sugar, because we don't want a flabby. Right gross wine we want it to feel fresh and we want you to want another sip because it's crisp on the finish and uh luckily with some of these grapes it's easy to keep a reasonable amount of acidity even if you let them hang for a while mm -hmm. so that is definitely i think what differentiates some of our sweet wines from other producers so the other tip i tell people if they because i think a lot of people have difficulty when understanding that fruit can be sweet, like you can smell sweet and not be sweet at the same time, right? Yeah. So I learned, I don't know where I learned it, probably in the WSET or whatever, that if you think a wine is sweet, but you're not sure if it's the fruit or the sweetness of the actual wine, if you pinch your nose when you taste it, if it's still sweet, it's sweet. Whereas if it's the fruit that's ripe, basically, then it doesn't do that, you know, you, you yeah. know. You're not tasting that sweetness anymore. That's very. So I was gonna. Ex I just wanted to explain that because I'm gonna pinch my nose and for people <laughs> who are watching why. Yeah. Uh, why I'm pinching my nose, but <laughs> so much of the tasting is aromatics, and they influence what we actually think we're tasting too. But it's all part of that whole experience. Right. right. And this, when you do pinch your nose that it is, you can still taste that sweetness, but I still go with that. It's, uh, it's not an in your face, overly sweet wine that it, you know, like that syrupy sweetness. It's no. not that at all. Right. Yeah. And that's no, it's, exactly it's, what it's very well balanced for the sweetness. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. So you had mentioned that you actually look for, uh, it's not just bricks level, you're paying attention to the acid levels and things like that also when you're harvesting harvesting uh, Delaware. Um, is there anything else that you, you know, rings the bell for you when it's, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm going to harvest now? 
I mean, uh, whenever we're sampling, we obviously look at the condition of the grapes. If there's disease pressure or something that might bump up your timeline a little bit, or you might have to go and drop some fruit at that point. If it's, and you want it, it's going to just go up as you vinify that. So you want it to be in a range that it's easy to have it microbially, microbially stable when you go to bottle after it does raise them. And aromatics and taste and the feel of them, if they're getting super soft, you know they're going to be closer. Uh, just tasting them and if they are showing those flavors that you want in Delaware, that's a good indication. You can also smell these grapes when you walk through the vineyard when they're getting close to time to pick. So oh, wow. Also another indicator. <laughs> that's awesome. Sure they bring the birds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The birds don't love Labrusca grapes. Oh, they like vinifera better? Oh, yeah. They like, you know, Gewurz, Pinot Noir, mostly. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Pinot They've Noir. Got expensive <laughs> <laughs> I love Pinot, but there's so many problems with Pinot. It is, it is so a problem with Kyle. It's lucky it's so delicious. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> The, uh, so, um, how much of the Delaware do you guys actually have planted and do, do you sell any of that off? We have about five acres planted between the two blocks and we use it all for ourselves. And we actually also purchase some Delaware, um, oh. locally. If so, our farm, we use all the grapes except some Concord and Niagara, which we sell to Welch's. And then we also subsidize with grapes from other farms, all local, 100% Finger Lakes always. Um, and we have some growers that we've worked with for many, many years. So we've got some really good relationships there and it gives us more options when we're blending and such. So we actually will ferment our different Delaware blocks separately and then taste through. We do make other products for some other wineries as well. And that was included in the gallonage I told you earlier. So we'll pick a specific lot for our Abbey Rose and um, we'll pick another one for like a blush, say we might make for another one. And that just depends on the goal with the wine. Um, we'll decide ahead of time that harvest if we're going to be able to make our dessert wine and those will let hang a bit longer. And we, for that product, we always- um, The dessert wine. Dessert wine. Yes. Yeah, so, and then I missed out after that. And the balance of our state fruit, or state Delaware, will go to the Abbey Rose. And then if we uh, need a little bit more, we can subsidize it from the other vineyards uh, that we purchased from. But typically, our state fruit is enough to do the iced wine and the iced wine and the Abbey Rose. And then the other ones we purchase go to the wines we make for other accounts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We try to prioritize estate fruit for our Lakewood Vineyards products. Makes Fair sense. enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair, yeah. Absolutely. So, in drinking this wine, besides like on a hot summer night or hot summer's day or drinking by the pool, mm -hmm. that's what I think of. What would you pair? What kind of food would you pair this with? So, I find that the Abbey Rose is delicious with pretty much anything cheese focus. Um, so just cheeses alone, some cured meats, but also like a pasta salad with cheddar in it. Um, it's good with barbecue even, especially if you have like a honey barbecue sauce on it, but just pork in and of itself has a sweetness. So a nice smoky pork dish is also a good pairing with this if you're trying to do it with like a main course. And of course, anything that has strawberries in it isn't too sweet. I don't it's not a dessert wine, but if you have a slightly sweet dessert and some fresh fruit in there, it makes a nice pairing that way. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that, definitely. So th I'm thinking this might be, a, and Debbie knows I'm horrible at food pairing because I don't eat anything, um, but I'm thinking this actually can go, you know, everybody's like, oh, wine and chocolate, wine and chocolate. And that's really an actual difficult pairing. It's so hard. Do. Mm -hmm. but I can, I can think of like, um, 
like some of those chocolate cakes that are not, you know, the ooey, not like the lava thing that's ooey gooey chocolate, right. but, but, you know, like the, the drier chocolate, like cakes. Yeah. Um, with like a cream cheese ingredient <laughs> too. That's yeah. less Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah, I made I a salted chocolate. I made a salted caramel dark chocolate um, pie. And I think this would go good with it. Probably. Yeah, I can see dark chocolate going, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it was yeah. really, I think it would taste really good. And it would give it that fruit element that would taste go well with the dark chocolate and then the salted yeah. caramel. And an Oreo cookie crust, it was really good. Oh, I see it. Yeah, that sounds oh. Definitely. Yeah. So we're kind of getting close to the end. And one of the things we always want people to know is like, you know, they're listening to the podcast they're watching the webinar and there's so much information that you've supplied to us about Delaware. So I'm going to ask you if you can tell us, uh, if you can give us like three, like fast facts, like if you want three things that people are going to walk away from this podcast or webinar from remembering about Delaware, what would they be? Um, well, I definitely want it to be things that will make people want to drink Delaware. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm going to go on a quick tangent first, because I think it's really interesting that uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, natives and hybrids with climate change and whatnot. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are uh, using these grapes for pet nets and trendier styles, natural wines and stuff. And there are a few producers doing that in New York State. So I do think it's one of those ones that might kind of come back in you know um for a while it was harold oh yeah well i'll we'll tell uh consider this one of my points about delaware but it was <laughs> heralded as one of like the best wine grapes that was growing in the eastern u.s uh in the late 1800s and early 1900s and it has like fallen out of fashion since then but, um, i i don't think necessarily forever I think it's one we can rely on even with the vintages being uh, vastly different from year to year. Um, I think that it can make a very complex wine and uh, that's to me really important. There are a lot of nuances to it, um, especially when it's done in like a sparkling style or a drier style table wine. And then the complexity it can add to a wine like this, it really, this wine would not be the same without the Delaware grape. And it can just be done in a million different styles. Like I said, dry, bottle fermented to dessert wine. It's awesome. very beloved in actually like Japan and South Korea for a sparkling wine grape. And I wonder if that is something that might become more popular here. Maybe not, but. Wow. So, so people from, from those countries, do they come to the Finger Lakes and buy? No, it is grown in Japan and South oh, Korea. Oh, it's grown. Okay, I didn't hear yeah. that. And yeah. And they produce a sparkling wine out of it. Oh, that's interesting. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. That is really that is really interesting. And then I have to point this out because this was in the it. box. <laughs> this was in the box. So this is this is Beverly. Yeah, so yeah. that's my and, grandmother. Okay, yeah. So there's grandma and David. Yep, the vineyard manager and my the vineyard uncle. manager, and then Chris. That's your. Chris is my dad. Your dad. You can tell okay. by the tan there which one works in the vineyard, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is. And then, and then the back has got all the wines that you produce. Um, it's got some of the wines oh. that we produce with the varieties that are in the last couple of years, but uh, yes, sustainably farmed. We plant north to south um, to prevent more erosion. We try to minimize the spray we use. We have solar panels and we have a compost facility. So all of the pumice from harvest and fermentations or just from pressing off, we actually compost, we combine it with chicken manure and uh, we'll spread it back in the vineyard. So that's really neat too. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, the weather station, date of plans. Question yeah. though, it says here the Delaware mm -hmm. found in Gla 
I can't pronounce. So this. Glacio Venum is the name of that dessert wine I was talking about. Oh, okay. And oh, and so that dessert um, wine has aromas of orange, banana, ginger, and vanilla bean. Yeah. Got it. Kind of more the spicy. Yeah. 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 Got it. And a dog. Who's the dog? Oh, that looks like it might be cake pan. We have um, like a number of different dogs running around the winery on any given day, but cake pan is the vineyard dog. It's Dave's dog who okay. his daughter named when she was four years old. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but he makes frequent appearances in the tasting room, you know, and he's got to come in and cool off. Absolutely. Very important. Very oh, yeah. important to make visits to the to the tasting room. Winery oh. dogs are very important. <laughs> yes, they are. Bring your dog and smart enough to go inside when it gets too hot. Yeah, yeah. I think he's just there for the free crackers, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most dogs are. <laughs> yeah. But they provide another attraction in themselves. So there's that, I suppose. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So Abby, tell us where people can find you or and Lakewood Vineyards if you want to reveal your, where you're found on <laughs> social media. But but Lakewood Vineyards on social media, on the web, how people can set up to come taste with you, where you're located. Okay, so um, we are on Seneca Lake on the west side of the lake, just about four miles north of Watkins Glen on Route 14. Uh, our Instagram is just Lakewood Vineyards, and uh, we are Lakewood Vineyards on Facebook. Our website is lakewoodvineyards.com. So I'm seeing a, a trend here. Seeing a trend. <laughs> <laughs> so we are actually, our tasting room is open 361 days a year. So we have four days off, um, and we're open Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5, and noon to 5 on Sundays. You do not have to make a reservation, but if you're coming on the weekend, I would recommend it just so you don't have to wait. But if you do end up having to wait, there's a lovely lawn and you can take the vineyard tour. So, yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's a pretty, a pretty way back. This has got to be in the early 2000s or something, yeah. maybe late 90s. I, I don't even remember. But I have a picture of me and my husband at Lakewood Vineyards, just uh, over Seneca Lake. I'll have to dig that out. That was like my first, that was my first visit up there. So, yeah. Well, we I'll have driving back and forth to Buffalo where I went to college. So, okay. <laughs> We've done some uh, landscaping efforts, like, and we put on an addition in 2016. So it's actually even prettier now. You can see the production room and the tanks as you walk into the winery. Mm -hmm. So, floor to ceiling windows there, which is pretty neat and just a nicer place, I think, to hang out than it was 10 years ago. And you have events as well, don't you? Yeah, we do. So. Some events we do, um, we participate in the Seneca Lake Wine Trail events, and then we do some smaller events here and there, and those are usually all over our social media. And that's how you, people can find out about them. Yep, absolutely. And our website, but I would just check, check our Facebook and our Instagram and you will be up to date. <laughs> well, Abby, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's just, it's, for me, it's wonderful to see you as a person and how, how you've grown into the to the woman that you are and the winemaker. It's like I'm, I'm dating my age here, but it's it's just it's just wonderful to just to see you, you know, prosper in the wine industry. Well, thank you. I'm excited that I get to do stuff like this with people that are paving the way like you ladies. So I appreciate <laughs> that. Pretty well, lucky to be here. Well, well, thank, thank you. you for sharing uh, Abby Rose with us and for sharing your knowledge of Delaware. I think these episodes of the not so familiar grapes are always the best episodes because there's just so much learning that can happen. You know, I mean, again, not to pick on Pino, but everybody <laughs> knows Pino, you know. So, you know, it's these it's these episodes that are the the not on the tip of your tongue varieties that yeah. really um, are at, the, at least to me the most exciting. So I feel the same way because yeah. I like bringing new things to people. And so, yeah. you know, that people <laughs> won't have, don't have a knowledge of. You know. so thank you very much. We yes. appreciate your time. We appreciate the wine. It is beautiful. So we yes. will raise our glass. Beautiful, just like you. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Thank you for thank you very much. Slide Cheers. Down. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this episode of Uncork Your Mind with Wine for Bed Street, Diaz for Delaware, and Abby Wilkins from Lakewood Vineyards. Wine for Bed Street is a program that Lori and I bring bring to the table every month. And every month it's a different grape or grape region with a different special guest. So I hope you join us. I want to thank you for listening. I am Debbie Giaquindo. I am the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, and you can find me online at HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com, HV Wine Goddess on Instagram and Twitter, and Hudson Valley Wine Goddess on Facebook. And for whatever podcast app you are listening to me on, if you can leave me a great review, I would greatly appreciate it. Till we meet again next month, cheers. <laughs>